Mr. Jeremy Foster, thank you so much for taking the time for this interview and we welcome you to Doha and to the Telecom and Media Conference, the, the forum. Thank you. And uh, we'd like first to know, if, uh, based on your speech today, the value chain for content providers, how uh, do you envision it and uh, what stages does it have? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I hardly have an exhaustive um, model for you in terms of the, uh, the value chain, but if you start with a consumer at the end, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably a good place to start. And what is the outcome that they're looking for themselves? Mm. They're either trying to improve their business or they're trying to improve their private life. Mm. Now, when it comes to the business, they're trying to earn more money, spend less money, mm. or differentiate themselves against their own competition. These are kind of the three main reasons why you ever make any change to business. Mm -hmm. From a private point of view, they're trying to have a better quality of life. Mm. And depending on if they're older or younger, if they're um, you know, traveling or students or working or whatever that might be, I mm. think this is a place where we start to consider mm. what does this value, what is the outcome of this value of the service that we provide to those, those consumers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then that's when you start working backwards and thinking, well, if someone is uh, accessing information to help them you know, um, provide a better value to their own customers, uh, how does that information come to them? Where do they source it? Who is involved in bringing it? Mm -hmm. And of course, at the moment, uh, wherever you and I go, mm -hmm. we usually have our mobile phone with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we're quite used to the idea that our mobile will be with us no matter where we go. Yeah. And, and this starts to become part of the mechanisms mm -hmm. for delivering us this information. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, what are we paying for mm -hmm. in all the different parts? Mm -hmm. Um, at the moment we pay some money to our operators, of course. Yeah. Um, maybe we start to subscribe to news or um, it was mentioned today that salesforce.com, which is a, a sales application, this is on the internet, so we could actually pay a subscription to the yeah. internet and yeah. then that would be part of the value equation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and as, uh, as so if the operator, the, um, the internet-based company and, uh, and me as a consumer, if maybe mm. if these things a part of the value proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, who is getting paid for delivering what? Mm. And uh, I, I think this is a good place to stop uh, and really leave all the listeners or the people who are viewing this interview to have a consider to consider for themselves. Who am I? Am I a consumer? Am mm -hmm. I an operator? Am I uh, creating a service, perhaps mm -hmm. on the internet or or some other way? Yeah. How does this service deliver value to my consumer mm. so that they'll buy it? Mm -hmm. They'll enjoy it, they'll value it, they'll mm -hmm. keep coming back. Yeah. And what role do I think I should play in terms of that uh, delivering value? Okay. And uh, you know, it can be done in so many different ways. Mm. Not just delivering the technology, but it could be refining, uh, refining the website or mm -hmm. a, a portal or an application so okay. it does a better job. Mm. Uh, there are many different roles to be played and mm. uh, uh, this probably is much of a, of a, of a soundbite, we should probably talk about that part now. Yeah. And then people can start to think for themselves, mm. um, what does it mean for me? Okay. When we speak of broadband demand, do you think, how do you envision the relationship between operator service providers and the regulators from, one side, from two sides and the consumer? The consumers are really thirsty for more, but how do you think service providers and regulators should go with that? Sure. You know, the interesting thing is that uh, we work so hard as an industry to hide all of the technology. Mm. We hide the cell sites, we hide the, the, the fibre optic cables. Uh, mm. uh, if we walked outside right now and, uh, and we looked out the window, mm. uh, I would have to carefully point out to you where a base station might be. Mm. But I can tell you that there is a lot of infrastructure out there. Mm. And uh, from a consumer point of view, we think that um, maybe my email turns up, you know, why should it be so expensive? Mm. Why should my internet be so expensive? Mm -hmm. Well, actually it's pretty hard. Mm. It's pretty hard to roll out infrastructure in order to deliver to no matter where we want to go, especially from a mobile point of view, okay. wherever we go, there's this term called um, ubiquitous. Okay. And this comes from the Latin word ubique. Mm -hmm. And ubique means everywhere. Mm. And everywhere is a lot of places. Mm. You know, it's wherever I might go, even where we're sitting in this hotel, making sure coverage, all these things work, is not an easy job. Mm. Uh, to answer your question, I think that uh, the value of broadband is uh, consumers, they really get it. It makes such a difference to their day. Mm. Uh, they can connect to their friends uh, in a way they never could before through Facebook. They can find information mm. um, through things like Wikipedia or Google. Mm -hmm. They can run their businesses more effectively via email or sales portals. They see an enormous amount of value. Mm. But over the years, we've kind of hidden, you know, protected them from seeing all the, all the, uh, all the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, one thing that we do see is that the amount of data being 
being uh, eaten up by applications like YouTube, for example, like okay. like MySpace and Flickr. Mm. Uh, this is creating a lot of um, a lot of data which our operators have to carry. Mm. And uh, and so um, and how much revenue uh, might an operator be able to earn from carrying all of this data? Mm. It's less and less. Mm -hmm. And so I um, rather than say which role uh, the regulator should play. Mm. Um, well, one thing I will say, I think they should get involved in the discussion about trying to imagine ourselves five or ten years in the future about, mm. you know, what, what is kind of a, um, uh, wh where are we headed uh, so that we can then work together to try and get there. Mm. And uh, it's no surprise that um, all of the equipment that we, as, a, as, as Ericsson, as an industry, as vendors, mm. that we deliver, it's expensive. Mm. You know, it's not cheap stuff. Mm. So the operators will be looking to make some kind of return on their investment, which of course they should. Yeah. And um, but some of the benefits that will come from this broadband will be from adjacent industries, from telecoms. It'll be mm. things like transport, logistics, petroleum. Mm. It'll be uh, professional services, real estate, tourism, mm. and uh, the the growth in all of these will create a benefit to the country, mm. which actually the government will be the the single point of gravity. Mm. Who can see all those benefits, and then, um, and then, so that uh, that we we can see the country has benefited from this broadband. Mm. And so, one thing I would encourage, and I see this happening, you know, across the region, is that regulators are um, are working, uh, and it's not just regulators; it's actually government is working with operators mm. to make sure that the needs of their people are continuing to be met, mm. and that innovation can continue to happen. Mm. And that the right investments are going to continue happening, okay. so that uh, from a uh, you know a regional point of view, mm. we can continue to ensure that Qatar can you know for example compete on the regional level mm. on an international level. Okay, you've been discussing the use of text messaging as advertising means. How do you think this is an effective marketing strategy? You know, uh, for me, uh, text messaging. Um, uh, there's no question it's a, it's a killer application. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about uh, this term killer application, there's been many definitions, but one definition I like is mm. that application which killed the previous way of doing that thing. Mm. So for example, no one really sends a telegram anymore, we send an email. Mm -hmm. No one really uses a typewriter anymore, we use a word processor like Microsoft Word for example. Yeah. Um, text messaging has become very prevalent and even though there was no previous way of doing things, doing mm. this thing, this short you know, communication, I think we can all argue that it's become a, um, um, a killer application. Everyone uses it. Mm. <clears throat> I think one of the challenges we have when you mention uh, advertising using text messages mm -hmm. is uh, that how do we make sure that the context of the text turning up mm. really makes sense mm. for, a, uh, for the person who receives it? Mm -hmm. And uh, what I see around the world is um, operators uh, uh, such as um, Vodafone, and I'm sure there's many others, but it's one that I've, I've worked for Vodafone, and I know they have very strict policies around things like um, when I can, as a consumer, I can opt in that I would like to receive text advertising. Mm -hmm. And it could be related to um, movies or fast-moving consumer goods or sale items or whatever. Mm. Um, I also see other operators uh, not having such a, uh, an approach, mm. not being disciplined about making sure that this text delivers value to the end users. Mm. And what I see some operators doing is simply selling a bulk of texts mm. and then you can just send it whatever you like. Mm. And I think the real challenge with that is that, you know, sometimes I get uh, text advertising for washing machines mm -hmm. and uh, it, doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't, um, uh, doesn't help me, I don't uh, enjoy it and in fact, you know, I actually uh, get annoyed as a consumer yeah. to the operator. I don't even think of the uh, of the company that's advertising to me. Mm. Uh, I don't. I'm not going to buy a washing machine either. Mm. But I'm annoyed that the operator hasn't thought about me a little bit more. Yeah. That uh, I, I I know how to turn on the washing machine. Yeah. But I don't really buy washing machines that often. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And so I would encourage uh, all operators everywhere to uh, consider their strategies around using text messaging as a medium mm -hmm. very carefully so that uh, their consumers are um, you know, satisfied that uh, who they were as individuals mm. uh, was taken care of mm -hmm. when that text turned up. Okay. So related to that is your value theory that you spoke about. So how does it uh, work? Yeah, what, uh, what I talked about was this idea that um, uh, 
in the uh, in, when I first joined this industry about 14 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, we imagined that one day you would walk past a hamburger shop, mm -hmm. and they would send you a picture or a text of a hamburger. Would you like a cheap hamburger? And the problem with that is that, uh, and we've never ever seen exactly this scenario be successful, mm -hmm. ever in the world, anywhere. Mm. Now the reason why this scenario hasn't been successful is that you need three pieces of information before that, that notification is useful. Okay. Yes, I know where you are, but are you hungry and have you got any money? Mm -hmm. Now if you're starving and you're broke and someone sends you a picture of a nice hamburger, mm -hmm. you're not going to be happy. Sure. And so uh, the lesson here for me was that uh, what we need to do is make sure we consider the context of the person mm. before we deliver them anything. Mm. And one of the big tipping points that I've, uh, or tipping technologies we've been talking about today, mm -hmm. uh, is actually uh, 700 years old. Mm. Hard to believe that something 700 years old would make a difference to us today, but you see in some of the, uh, in the latest iPhone, and we see in some models of Japanese phones, which already have, you know, fast broadband, nice TV, nice screen, cameras for imaging, yeah. um, positioning via GPS or mm -hmm. some other positioning, we start to see them coming with a compass. Mm. And the interesting thing about a compass is that now it's not just the system knows where I am, it also knows what I'm looking at. Mm. Because you can geospatially record all these elements inside a city, for example, or in a shopping mall or whatever, and now I know where you are. If I know where you're looking, I can then filter out all of the information which is not contextual to you. Mm -hmm. And so if you imagine, uh, for those um, maths geeks in your audience, uh, if you filter out 355 degrees of your 360 and you only just give someone 5 yeah. degrees of that, that's 98% of information you just don't even present. Mm. Now what that means is, is that um, as you move around you can start to uh, uh, create some context and um, uh, what we see in places like Japan for mm -hmm. example is that they're actually mixing the idea of the camera, um, you know, the viewfinder image with your position, the direction you're looking at and so as I look at, um, you know, uh, this, uh, this image of um, um, wherever I might be standing, yeah. because the system knows where I am, and knows what I'm looking at, it can start to give me virtual information on top of the camera image that I can see. Mm -hmm. Now if I'm hungry, mm. and I'm hungry quite a bit, so I might press the button, you know, feed me. Mm. So now when I hold my phone up, as I start to look around, I use it to um, start to pop up all these you know, icons or mm -hmm. adverts or pictures on top of my, um, what I'm looking through mm. uh, with all the restaurants that I might be interested in, in buying from. Mm -hmm. And of course those restaurants will need to buy advertising rights to be popping up. Mm. Um, but also the interesting thing is that uh, when, when I create the context, when I, I give them permission because I said I'm hungry, I press the button, I'm hungry, feed mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And so now by definition I'm hungry and I've got money. Mm -hmm. So now you can give me all the information you yeah. like. Mm. And uh, it's, um, uh, the term is, uh, it's called augmented reality. And uh, I think this will be, um, you know, when we, when we think of you and I, we don't have to be technically savvy yeah. for this to really add value to my day. Mm. And um, uh, it's like using the virtual world to click on the real world because as soon as you start to see some icon come up over a particular restaurant, then you could easily click on that and start to pull some information. You could even then t say, take me there, and now your device, because it's got a compass, mm. it can then tell you which direction, turn left, turn right, go this way, go that way. Mm -hmm. um, because it might be, uh, you might say, I'm, I'm happy to go within five kilometres from here. Okay. What's around, you know? Mm. Um, and, uh, or what's in this direction, I'm heading that direction, what's in this direction? Mm. So the value, the, the idea of making sure that the information is, is uh, valuable, mm. you just need to make sure it's delivered in context, and I mm. really believe that uh, this combination of these four technologies will, um, and with the compass, mm -hmm. to help filter out all of that noise mm. and just give us something that's just, what am I looking at right now? Yeah. I think that this is uh, going to be a tipping point around how um, mobile devices will add a lot more value than they've ever done already in the past. Mm -hmm. So is it true that the Arab world is always on the receiving end when it comes to innovation? Or do you think uh, otherwise? I think that um, uh, the Arab world has um, uh, two challenges to overcome, okay. two major challenges. The first challenge is that fuel is not expensive. Mm -hmm. The second challenge is that um, labour is not expensive. Mm -hmm. 
And if you think about what telecoms, uh, telecommunications as an industry does, it's not so interesting to think about you know, how we change for ourselves, it's the impact we have in every other industry. Yeah. And uh, in every other industry, we usually have assets and fuel and people and real estate and sales forces and marketing departments, all of these things. And uh, of course, that creates a cost base for our business and we have to earn some money, we have to spend some money and the difference is the profit. Mm. So everything we try and do is we try and reduce our costs and we try and increase our revenue mm -hmm. because you have to earn more money than you spend to sure. go to business. Yeah. Now some of the expensive things that we have in, in the Western world, um, certainly where I come from, fuel and people, they're very expensive things. Mm. And, uh, and so you know, some of the initial um, innovations that you start to see, I believe, uh, around the world is things that can make more out of someone Mm -hmm. get them to meet more customers or mm -hmm. you know be able to get more working time in their day or uh, maybe it's uh, fuel consumption mm. uh, I'd like my trucks I have a fleet of trucks they need to you know use less fuel mm. um, because it's very expensive and maybe I'll implement some GPS tracking solution or mm. some routing solution so so these these major costs in the in, in the Western world and you know in uh, Asia Pacific where I come from uh, in New Zealand, uh, these things start to get people thinking, hmm, how can I use telecommunications to save me money here? Mm. And, uh, and so I think what happens is, is that uh, they start to you know, focus on these, uh, on these costs to try and reduce them. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, um, our region here is blessed mm. and cursed, depending on your point of view. Yeah. Every sword is a double edge. Sure. Uh, but ultimately they're blessed with uh, uh, amazing natural resources. Mm. And, uh, and I believe that uh, if necessity is the mother of innovation, mm -hmm. um, if we take away some of the necessities, then we take away some of the innovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the obvious ones for me are uh, people and fuel. Okay. And um, um, you know, the, one of the um, big advantages that, the, uh, that the, this regional uh, region has over the rest of the world is that uh, it's a very powerful strategy to be following and watch out for what everyone else, all the mistakes they made. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, um, but also as technology evolves, you don't need to invest in technology uh, that made sense uh, 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. You can invest, you can actually leapfrog yeah. the technology that, used to, that you know, made sense before today. Mm. So I don't think that uh, there's no such thing as a bad, a good or a bad thing. Okay. It is the reality. Mm. And uh, I think ultimately, um, what we'll find is that uh, you know this region will be able to pick up technology mm -hmm. um, so fast mm. um, because they won't have to climb the difficult stairways that the rest of us have had to climb. Mm. They will be able to choose what is best and then implement it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the people that I meet as I travel all around, they're very very innovative. Mm. Um, but usually they're they're innovative to overcome uh, challenges which I don't have to normally face back home. Mm. Uh, the good thing is, as you implement technology and they have a need man, they can implement it quickly. And so mm. uh, I think uh, it will still be exciting to see how uh, this region decides to you know, invest in technology and, and take yeah. itself forward. Mm. But um, you know, being a follower is not such a bad thing. Mm. So my final question would be net neutrality. That's a very hot topic. And for those who don't know what net neutrality is, can you give us your definition of it, how you, your take on it? Yeah, I mean, net neutrality is a uh, fascinating uh, discussion. and. Um, uh, you know, Ericsson's stake in this whole business is that uh, when operators buy infrastructure from vendors like ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, it costs a lot of money mm. and it's used to carry a lot of data. Mm. And uh, the, the metaphor, if you like, is uh, if you imagine that um, someone built a, a six lane highway mm. and uh, it was pretty empty and we would enjoy the highway, we would drive our cars and we would get where we want to go mm. and uh, someone decided to put a truck on that highway. Mm. And, uh, and earn some money from that. And that doesn't sound so bad. Mm. And, uh, and we didn't think that there was any big deal with that at all. Okay. Now what we find is that uh, the amount of um, uh, data being shifted from, for example, the, uh, the YouTubes and the Flickers and the MySpaces and you know, these um, very um, compelling uh, internet uh, applications mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the Googles and so on, some of them are monetizing that, mm. earning money from it, and some aren't. Mm. But uh, something that we all agree on is that that data has to be carried somehow. And the idea of net neutrality is that at the moment, 
um, the uh, the operators in the world are uh, are bearing all of that traffic. Mm. They bought the equipment. Some of it they bought from us. Some of it they bought from someone else. Mm. And uh, but nevertheless, it got paid for. Mm. And uh, the idea is that um, all of these uh, internet players they would like because they haven't been charged um, over and above. Uh, their own basic access to the internet mm. um, and their own basic hosting for their servers, they haven't been charged for, you know, when, when you and I access it wherever we might be, mm. and all of the hops between me and them, mm. those hops, the stuff in the middle, that doesn't get paid for by uh, the, um, uh, the application provider of the internet site. Mm. And of course, they would like that everything would keep that happening just like that. Mm. The net should be neutral. Mm. It should belong to everyone. Mm. But unfortunately, um, the laws of economics still reply, uh, apply. You have to you know, yeah. earn more money than you spend. You've got a business, someone has to pay. Um, there's nothing, no such thing as a free lunch. Mm. And, um, and so the, uh, the discussion, if you like, is between those operators um, and, uh, and the industry who pays for the infrastructure. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and as the dramatic, I mean, it's uh, explosive, um, and we can think of all the words that you can imagine to make it even bigger still, uh, the demand in, bro in broadband is just so enormous mm. that uh, you know, I think that our industry is struggling to keep up. Mm. And certainly if you throw in the, uh, the value proposition of actually earning money, I think there's a real question mark over that. Yeah. It's very difficult to be able to shift all this data. Yeah. So meanwhile, uh, the, uh, these internet sites are, are basically benefiting from the, uh, the network that exists. Mm. And, uh, and, and they would like to continue benefiting as if they had now taken our six lane highway mm. and filled it up completely with trucks. Mm. And, uh, and maybe you, know, you and I get one lane to share with our little cars and, and meanwhile these trucks are dominating this, this lane, six lane highway. Mm. Well, um, I believe we're gonna start to get to the points of congestion and you know, operators are continuing to invest in capacity and, mm. and, and we're developing technology to make that cheaper but I believe that the, con the consumption of data is just so enormous mm. that, uh, that I think we're all struggling to keep up. Mm. And uh, so net neutrality is about who should pay. Mm. Should, should Google get sent a bill, for example, yeah. um, because someone accessed a Google site um, in the United Arab Emirates and yeah. uh, the local um, hub was somewhere else in the world yeah. and uh, all of the hops between that, should, should Google be charged for that, yeah. for, as an example? Um, and uh, who would be the jurisdiction over such a thing? This is a point raised today. Mm. Uh, of course, all of our regulators and government, they can only have jurisdiction inside their own countries. Mm. Mm. So it's, uh, it's not obvious who has an overall jurisdiction over the internet. Mm. So it's, uh, it's, it's very uh, fascinating times, and you know, for, for me there's no um, black and white answer, um, there's always grey everywhere, but mm. we, we at Ericsson feel that um, this net neutrality, um, pretending that everything can continue to be free, mm. I think that that's um, uh, unrealistic at best and uh, nonsense at mm. worst. Okay. Someone will have to pay. And uh, you know, again, we're continuing to invest in technology to make it cheaper to shift all, those, all that data, mm. but Installing, implementing, maintaining that equipment will cost money mm. and, uh, and that will have to come from somewhere. Mm. And uh, I think uh, there will be lots of discussion from here on in as to um, what is fair and reasonable and mm. uh, these are very subjective ideas mm. and uh, it should be interesting to see the discussion unfold. Thank you so much for this lovely interview You're and most we welcome. welcome you again to Doha. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Cheers. Thanks.